Okay, guys, um, welcome to tonight's lesson. So it's FAC 4861, FAC, sorry, it's MAC 4861, MAC 4862. Um, we're going to be covering valuations tonight. <clears throat> valuations is a huge, a huge topic. Um, so we will give you a high level overview of the, of the various valuations, when to use them and so forth. And then tonight we will do one question um, it's in the, I sent, I attached a tat letter in um, the email I sent earlier this afternoon. So um, there's one type of valuation. There is five different valuations that you need to know. I'll run through them, I'll give you a high level overview, and then you will come to realize that the valuation that is most important is three important ones out of the lot that you must be able to do, okay? You must be able to do all five, but three out of the lot is the big ones. The rest is not as big. So let's jump straight into it. So they're going to ask you, um, you're probably always going to get a valuation question. Maybe not always, but often, because it's a huge topic. You use it in many places, whether in financial accounting, in investments, and if you're an auditor, you have to audit valuations and all of those type of things, okay? So um, it is, you use it quite often. If you're in the investment world, then valuations is used all the time. In financial accounting, it depends on the, um, on the type of um, resources the company have in terms of the type of business that they run and all of those type of things, then you, will, you may have to perform valuations. And then in audit, if you are going to be um, uh, auditing companies that, that perform valuations, then you will be able, you will be, you will need to be able to, um, in order to audit evaluation. Over and above that is just the principles of valuation that will play a key role in you just understanding um, management accounting or financial management, because valuations is a huge part of um, financial management. So what you should know. Um, we basically have about seven, there's about seven um, valuations. Technically speaking, six, but let's just say seven, okay? So you have the free cash flow, you have the dividend growth model, you have the, the earnings multiple, you have um, the earnings yield, um, or earnings multiple, you have um, the NAV, you have EVA, and then this one is not really a valuation, but it is, um, but then you also have a market capitalization method. Market capitalization is not really a valuation method, but let's just say, okay. Now out of those six, I said seven because under earnings yield, there are two. Under earnings yield, we will cover um, PE multiple as well as the, um, the earnings yield multiple, okay? So what you should know under the earnings valuation, there are different types of earnings multiples. For example, the PE multiple, the earnings yield multiple, um, the, e the EBIT multiple, the EBITDA multiple. There's different types of multiples. The, one the ones we're going to cover is the PE multiple and the earnings yield. Why the earnings yield? Because the earnings yield is simply an inverse of the PE multiple. So if you can do the PE, you should be able to do the earnings yield because one is the inverse of the other. So... Um, that's the two. But in the real world, the typical one you most likely come across is the EBITDA multiple, but it's not really part of the syllabus, um, but you must know it. Okay, so if you read the valuation chapter in a textbook, that multiple will be there because it's a, it's a common one that gets used. So, so, we, so there's six. Out of the six, we said um, Market capitalization, that's not a really a valuation method, but we just include it. And then we said EVA. EVA um, is hardly ever tested, but you should know how to do it. But it's hardly, hardly ever tested. So we're not going to go through EVA. We're not going to go through market capitalization because market capitalization is not really a um, evaluation method. And also we have covered it in WAC, okay? Because market capitalization is basically value equals number of shares in issue times share price. Then EVA, we're not going to cover. So that means we are left with five or four, okay? So we're left with the earnings multiple, which is made up of 
uh, PE multiple and earnings yield. We left with the dividend growth model. We left with the net asset value model, and we left with um, the free cash flow model. Now, out of those four, the the dividend growth model you have covered already. Where did we cover the dividend growth model? We covered it in in WAC. So there's nothing new in the dividend growth model. Okay, so that means we left with three earnings multiple, which is PE and earnings yield, NAV and free cash flow. NAV is um, it's not. You don't use NAV as your only valuation model. You use the net asset value method solely as a reasonability check. The net asset value model is basically taking NAV. What is NAV? Net asset value. What is net asset value? It is equity. So you're taking the balance sheet, the equity of a company's financial statements. So the equity section of the balance sheet, you take that number. You start off with that number when you do a NAV valuation. The only difference is that that NAV balance on the balance sheet is historical, is looking into the past. So all we do, we make fair value adjustments. You know, like we do in, 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 um, in, um, in groups where you start off with equity and you make any fair value adjustments, the exact same thing we do in, um, in the NAV valuation method. You start off with the equity balance and you make um, value, you make market value adjustments, because we don't want a NAV based on book value. We want a NAV based on market value. Now, remember what is NAV? NAV is net, um, net asset value, which is equity. What is that? Another way to look at equity is assets minus liabilities. So included in those um, assets may be assets that is um, not at market value. So we make the necessary adjustments. So, so what's important to understand, when you're doing a valuation in terms of NAV, you don't want a NAV based on book value, you want NAV based on market value. So that's really like a five marker. So when they ask you for net, net asset value valuation, it's gonna be five marks. So. So we saw out of the three, we left now with the earnings multiple and we left with free cash flow. These two is going to be the big ones. Okay, so free cash flow, earnings multiple. Those two is going to be the big ones. When I say big, 10, 15, 20 marks. Okay, if you look at past exam, if I, if I think of a UCT paper, like 40, 50 marks. Okay, but this is a test. So they're not going to give 40 marks valuations. Okay, they're going to give you good, good 10, 15, 20 marks. If it is free cash flow, if it is earnings multiple, valuations can make up bigger because they may ask you ask you for the NAV, then that's five marks. They may maybe bigger ask you for market cap, then it's about three marks. You understand? So then it adds up to a big amount. But if you look at one valuation, the big 15, 10, 15, 20 mark one valuation would be a, a, a PE multiple, earnings multiple, either PE or EY, earnings, uh, earnings yield, or it will be a free cash flow. Why not dividend growth model? The reason why not dividend growth model is they will test dividend growth model in WAC. Okay, so they're going to test your dividend growth model, but most likely in WAC. So they will try to make sure they, they test different valuation methods throughout a paper. Now, you're not necessarily right on WAC in test two, so they may bring on dividend growth model, but highly unlikely, um, because they can test it again in future when they give you a WAC question. So just take a note. So when you sit back now, you need to know that you have seven valuation me methods, okay? Um, um, market cap or market cap, not so important, but you covered in WAC. And also, it's not a really evaluation method. Then you have EVA, economic value added. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry about that. Then you have um, economic value added. Not an easy valuation, but, um, and, uh, but you hardly ever get tested on it. Okay, so we're not going to cover that. Then we said um, NAV. That's like a three mark, uh, a five marker. We explained that. Then we see dividend growth model big, but hardly ever going to be tested under valuations because they will, they will most likely test it in um, in WAC. Then we have earnings yield, PE multiple. 
those two are big, will either be earnings yield or PE, and which is the same thing. Just one is the inverse of the other. It's the exact same thing. And then lastly, the free cash flow. So now I'm going to give you a high-level overview on when you use what, okay? Um, because I remember when I wrote a board two exam, the comment um, was typically given a valuation. The valuation is given to you, and then you need to discuss a few issues. So for example, one of the, one of the key things you will first discuss, and if you, if you read, if you pick up a investment report, so they call it, um, so if you pick up a, a, an investment equity report, if you just Google um, uh, investment equity analysis, and you pick up a, if you happen to find a report, on the first page of that report, um, they give a summary, right? So I can't remember what they call it, but in, in investments, they call it summary, where before they look into the detail, it's like a, a, a full page or even just like a, a half of the page where you put in a square block all the key information. One of the key information that you put in there is the valuation method you used, okay? Then if you read into the further detail, the, one of the first things you start off before delving into the valuation is to discuss the valuation method you used and why you used that valuation method. That is one of the first things you will find in an, in, in an equity analyst report. So that's one of the things they ask you to discuss a, a, a valuation, to analyze a valuation. The first thing you need to discuss is whether the valuation method used is appropriate before you get into other, the other nitty gritties. And that is why in many cases, when you read the required, they will tell you, ignore the valuation method or assume that the valuation method is appropriate because they know in the real world, um, first determining whether the valuation method used is appropriate, that's the first thing, one of the first things that gets done. So when you look at the valuation method, uh, the, the, the one thing you want to have a look at is, is the valuation method appropriate? Now, the, um, like we said, the, the, value, the, the common valuation method you can have available, free cash flow, earnings, and um, free cash flow, earnings, and dividend growth model. Okay, so we'll discuss those three. The details is also in the notes on the platform. One of the things you need to ask yourself is, from whose perspective are you doing a valuation? Are you doing a minority valuation? Are you doing a majority valuation? If you're doing a minority valuation, you will most likely not use the free cash flow method. You will most likely not use the free cash flow method. Because remember, as a minority interest, you are unable to impact the cash flow of a company. What, what is your benefit as a minority holder? Dividends. So then the most appropriate method would be the dividend growth model. If you are a majority holder, then the, then the um, free cash flow method would be appropriate. Why? You have a say in terms of the revenues earned and all of those type of things. You can impact the cash flows. And as a result, the free cash flow would then make sense to you because you would be able to impact the drivers of the, of the free cash flow model. And as a result, any small tweak that you can control will, will change the value of the company. Whereas from a minority interest, there's nothing you can change. All you are doing is looking at what the company is doing and receiving a dividend. And that is why you use a dividend growth model over there. So when do you use a dividend growth model? When you have a minority, when do you use a free cash flow? When you have a majority. That's one of the reasons. Another reason, or then if you look at the PE multiple, the PE multiple in the real world gets used more often. The reason is, um, the reason that they use a, the PE multiple more often because the, uh, apparently um, with, with the free cash flow, there's too much risk. What is the risk? The risk of forecasting. So you look, when a free cash flow, you have to forecast financial statements into the future, let's say five years, the aim is to do 10 to 15 years. 
and then you do a valuation. Now, no one can do a forecast really that well. So there's too much risk. So in most cases, they just use, a, use an earnings yield method. So the PE multiple or the EBITDA multiple. So just take note. So the PE multiple EBITDA will also be used in um, if you have a majority interest. But for our purposes, the um, way the PE multiple will be used most often is when you are valuing a unlisted company. So when you want to make an investment in an unlisted company, a private company, then you will use the PE multiple. Okay. So we said what's important, when to use evaluation. So dividend growth model, minority. This is high level stuff, it's not, it's not cast in stone. So dividend growth model, dividend growth model, you use minority. Free cash flow, you use for majority. Um, the, the earnings yield most likely gets used when you, are, when you are valuing an unlisted company, a private company. When um, another aspect, now we look at dividend growth specifically. The dividend growth model can only be used technically if there is a history of dividends that is predictable. So if there's a history, and a history means 10 to 15 years of unbroken dividends that is predictable. So for example, like when you do ShopRite, most analysts use the dividend growth model for ShopRite because it, it reduces um, the use of free cash flow. Like I said, in the real world, investment analysts hardly use a free cash flow model because of the, the risk of forecasting. So they 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 um, they tend to use either the dividend growth model or they use the earnings the, 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 an earnings multiple model. So like a, like the PE or most or more often the EBITDA multiple. So for dividend growth model. Some of the assumptions is that there must be a history of dividends. And a history don't mean three years, a history mean 10, 15 years. A history also means unbroken for 10 to 15 years. And it also means it is predictable. Okay, when we say predictable, if you pick up ShopRite, right? Well, maybe I'll try to pick it up. If, we, if you pick up ShopRite's financial statements, then some way try to find the dividend per share or the dividends declared and compare it to the earnings. So you say dividends divided by earnings or you, or sorry, you say earnings divided by dividends or you say earnings per share divided by dividend per share. You will see probably for the last 10 years at least the, 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 um, the, the dividend cover was two. So it's predictable what the dividends is going to be. So you generally use a dividend growth model over there because it's predictable what the dividend will be. It is, um, earnings will be two times the dividends and there's a history of dividends. Um, so you will use a dividend growth model. And obviously the only thing you will have to estimate, not only, but one of the things you'll estimate is earnings. So you estimate earnings. Once you have earnings, you know dividends is, um, earnings per, um, the dividend cover is two, you get the dividend from the earnings and you do a dividend growth model. So that is basically um, the, the key assumptions when it comes to dividends. An unbroken history of dividends, 10 to 15 years of dividends that is unbroken, that's predictable. When we say predictable, there's a constant cover, okay? So that is um, for the dividend growth model. So if you, if you read CFA notes, CFA will tell you always use dividend growth model unless you can't. If you can't, then you look to free cash flow. Um, if you, uh, if we, if we, if we um, so as most people would say that, what we got taught at UCT, and maybe not UCT specifically, but, law, but rather the lecturer. So you know the textbook I use? Uh, I don't know if you guys use that textbook as well. By, um, so, the, so financial management by Carlos Carrera. So he obviously teaches his own thing, but he's like a guru in financial management. So, and valuation specifically. So he's a guru in valuations. Um, and he is again big on free cash flow. So he will always say free cash flow is a better way. Um, and he admits that in the real world, they hardly use it, but they're slowly coming to it. But if I speak to um, like, so like, like my wife is an investment analyst, 
um, and she had been for three different places now, and they all use earnings multiples or dividend growth model. Um, they hardly use the free cash flow. And like I said, the reason why part of the philosophy, uh, part of the reasoning is that the free cash flow has too much forecasting risk. So when so so these are important discussion points when it comes to dividend growth. Okay. Then we look at um, then we look at the free cash flow. So tonight's question is on the free cash flow. Some of the assumptions you are a majority shareholder. Okay. The free cash flow has two parts. It has an explicit period and it has a terminal value. An explicit period and a terminal value. What is a terminal value? Another word for a terminal value is the continuing value, okay? What is the explicit period? The explicit period is the period where you can forecast um, cash flows for specific number of years. So ideally you want it 10 to 15 years, but like we say, 10 to 15 years is very long. No one can really forecast that long, but ideally you want 10 to 15 years. Three to five years is too short from a financial manage, from a valuations point of view. So one of the things you will look at when you, um, one of the things you want to look at is when they give you a valuation and they not, and they don't tell you to ignore um, the valuation method. You want to consider whether the valuation method is appropriate. If it's a majority, you're fine. You can go with it. Then you always want to have a look at the explicit period. You want the explicit period to be at least 10 years, um, but ideally 15 years. Okay. Um, but then again, in reality, can you really forecast 10 to 15 years? We don't know, but ideally you want it to be that long. The reason being is the majority of the value of the company using the free cash flow method will be from the terminal value. The terminal value is the value that goes in, goes, gets an amount that represents forever and ever. So let's say you have a 10 year period, then um, the terminal value represents year 11 up until the end of time. Okay, So you can imagine that from year 11 up until the end of time is far more significant than 11 years, than 10 years. So that terminal value will, will be significant. That terminal value is the most sensitive part because that one is going to provide the, 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 the um, that, that terminal value will represent the major part, the, 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 the biggest part of the value of the company. So that is why the longer the period of of um, of, for, of the explicit period, the longer the, the, the explicit period, the less sensitive that um, terminal value will be. So just take note, you want it to be 10 to 15 years. Now, just to link to financial reporting. When we come to test three, you're going to deal with impairment, IAS 36. When you deal with impairment, you have to work out the recoverable amount. The recoverable amount is the higher of value in use and fair value, less cost to sell. Now the value in use as a CTA two student, you're gonna to have to calculate the value on value in use, or it will be given and you must analyze it. Now when the value in use must be determined in terms of IAS 36 impairment, we will use a free cash flow model. But IAS 36 makes it clear that when you perform a valuation model for the value in use, you are limited to five years. Now, why I'm telling you this in an exam when they integrate stuff, they may give you a valuation that the financial manager prepared. So let's say you happen to do a valuation for a company. Now you're also gonna use this for impairment purposes, but perhaps his valuation model took, his, his explicit period was 10 years. What did accounting say? Your explicit period is limited to five years. So just take note of those kind of differences where they can bring that in. Okay, so that's all that you need to know that with the valuation free cash flow, we have explicit period and the terminal value. We're gonna go into the detail now in doing a question, but before we do the question, let's discuss PE. 
With the PE multiple, the way you're going to calculate the PE multiple is going to say value equals PE multiplied by maintainable earnings. The PE multiple will be based on a comparable company. Because like we said, you're most likely going to use the PE multiple when, you, when, you value, when you're valuing an unlisted company. So if, you, if a company is unlisted, you won't have a PE because PE is share price divided by earnings per share. An unlisted company don't have a share price, okay? So you will use a PE of a comparable company and then you will make adjustments for differences between the comparable company and your company, the target company, to get to a PE multiple. So just take note, your PE multiple, you start off with a comparable listed company and you make adjustments so that it represents your, P, your company's PE multiple. Then we have maintainable earnings. Maintainable earnings will be the earnings of the target company, the company you are valuing. And then you will make the necessary adjustments. You want, what adjustments are we gonna make for? Any once off um, items, any things that will not go, happen into the future. So if something is once off, if it's irregular and it's not gonna take place in the future, you need to adjust for those, okay? So you remove that numbers. Then you will have to have a look which maintainable number you're going to use. Are you going to use an average or are you going to use the latest number? So what you should know, you use the latest number, the latest maintainable earnings, if there is a upward trend or a downward trend. So if there's a trend, you will use the latest year's number, earnings number. If the earnings is erratic, one year it's up, two years it's down, then it goes up again, then you can't use the latest year because there's no trend, then you use a weighted average, okay? So just take note of that. But what are we going to do? I'm gonna focus on, um, I'm going to do free cash flow. then I will do another valuation, whether it's a, a class we have or whether it is um, a recording I do on the PE multiple. But the NAV, that's easy. Dividend growth model, we covered that multiple times. Um, and um, market capitalization, we've covered that multiple times. The earnings yield is just the inverse of the PE multiple. So when we cover the PE multiple, I'll show you how to think when it comes to the earnings yield. All you need to know is the PE multiple. And if you are given the, the earnings yield, you either convert it to be a PE multiple or if they tell you you have to use the earnings yield, then I'll show you how to think when it comes to using the earnings yield. So there's nothing new to learn. Okay. Do you have any questions before we move on? Faid, Fakir, Ilan? No question. No questions. Narato, Rebecca, Ryan. No questions. Okay, so can you guys open up that um, that scenario? Um, if I remember correctly, okay, so I just open up my side. I can't remember the page number. So we're going to do one of the tests 
Um, I think it was page 50. Really opening up my side, it's taking its own time. Uh, I think it's page forty seven. So I'm going to check quickly. Yeah, so page 47, what I want you to do, I'm gonna give you five minutes to read and then I'll read it with you afterwards, okay? So take five minutes to read it, um, page 47, and then I will read it with you afterwards. So I'll give you now the quarter pass. Just give me a thumbs up once you're all ready, okay?
Just give me a thumbs up once you're all ready. I'll give you slow reading. Okay, who's still reading? Everybody ready? Can we go? I'll give you two more minutes, then we have to start. Faid, Darato, Ryan, Dandi, Rebecca, done reading. Okay, let's get going. <clears throat> so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, can you see? Okay, you should be able to see now. I don't know, let's check again. Okay, yeah, you should be able to see, okay? So let's have a look. Um, so we have Decadent Chocolates, PTYLTD. Um, so you need a 2019 test. Let's say ignore value added tax, okay? So background. Decadent Chocolates, PTYLTD is a private company that was founded in the early 1990s in South Africa by Mr. Williams, who learned the art of making chocolate in Belgium. Mr. Williams was always passionate about chocolate, about chocolate making and only used the finest ingredients in his creations. 
It didn't take a long time for consumers to be impressed with Mr. Williams' chocolate making skills, and DC quickly grew into a successful business. Customers appreciate how creative DC is, is in making chocolate, even after being in operation for so many years, and trust the quality of the products. Okay, just a basic background. Change to business strategy. This. Yeah, page 47. What is page? What is this? Oh, is it the wrong one? Sorry. Thanks. Everybody listening and <laughs> thanks, Rebecca. Um, let's start from overs. Okay. So this is the right one. You just check quickly, okay, doesn't check the required. Yeah, it's this one. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca, for not letting me read all for nothing. Okay, so Kosili, PTY LTD. So very important. It's a private company. It's a company that manufactures and installs vehicle tracking devices and performs tracking service for various clients in South Africa. Customers who purchase devices from Cusilo can choose to, su to subscribe for tracking services with Cusilo or any other service providers. Cusilo has been in operation for the past 10 years and has chosen to remain an unlisted entity. Okay, so just gonna, if you read again, okay, so in, in paragraph number one, I mean in sentence number one, Cusilo is a, is a PTY LTD, is a company that manufactures and installs vehicle tracking devices and performs tracking services for various clients in South Africa. So in that sentence, what we pick up, we have a private company that manufactures and installs vehicle tracking services. That's number one. And then they perform tracking services for various clients in South Africa. Then they say customers who purchase devices from Cusilo can choose to, su to subscribe for tracking services with Cusilo or any other service providers. Why well, I wanna bring that attention to you, it's not that it's gonna matter over here, but that would matter in a financial reporting question. So you would, so we are in, in FAC 4862, FAC 4864, we're dealing with revenue. So what you must know, a sentence like this would have an impact on, on the five, um, on the five um, step, the five step model of revenue. So just be aware of that, okay? So the fact that you can buy a device from Cusilo, but you're not required to um, in, um, have, have them install it or have them have a tracking or take a tracking service with them, you can still buy the device from them and have a tracking service with someone else. That plays a key role in terms of um, the five-step model. So just be aware of that. Um, they say Cusilo has been in operation for the past 10 years and has chosen to remain an unlisted entity. Okay, so they're unlisted, no share price, so they won't have a PE multiple. <clears throat> the following financial information of Cusilo has been correctly prepared by the management accountant. Extract, uh, extract of statement of profit or loss um, of Cusilo for the period ending ended 30th March. So we have 2019, we have 2018, and we have a change. Okay, so remember you're dealing with this test two in test two for financial management for Mac. You have covered um, mergers and acquisitions, valuations, and then financial statement analysis. Okay, so here could be something on financial statement analysis. So here we have revenue. Revenue Im improved from, 20, um, from 2019, from 2018 to 2019, 
and the break up revenue. Here we have device service sales and we have subscription revenue. So remember, if you think about this from a financial reporting point of view, um, device sales will most likely be at a point in time, whereas subscription revenue would be recognized over a period of time. Not relevant for this, but just so that we know, you can kind of think about the revenue that we do in fact two, fact four. Then we have cost of sales and then we have a gross profit. So as you can see, cost um, revenue improved by 15.54%. Um, and the, the biggest improvement was as a result of the, um, the device sales. Um, cost of sales in um, also increased, which means cost of the um, cost of sales increased. So obviously you incurred more costs, but the uh, but but the positive part is that um, your cost increase is far less than the revenue increase. That's the positive. If the revenue increase, you don't want cost to increase by the same amount because in, in effect the increase in the revenue will be offset. Yeah, it is not completely offset. So that is a positive. And then we have gross profit, which is 32%. Okay, so um, a significant increase. What causes increase? We have no idea. Okay, then we have common size analysis. So common size analysis we have revenue, 100%, 100%. So with common size analysis, you would have one base, okay? So the base over here is revenue. So make revenue 100%. So we're saying as a percentage of revenue, how much is device sales? As a percentage of revenue, how much is subscription? So as you can see, this is gonna add up to 100 because it's, it's splitting the revenue number up, okay? Then cost of sales, cost of sales is making up 54% of revenue. We last year made up 60% of revenue. Gross profit is 46% of revenue, whereas last it was 40%. So as you can see, because you reduced costs relative to last year, we were able to um, in, improve gross profit. Then we have subscription revenue. So this is probably gonna be a financial statement analysis question. We have a number of subscribers. So the, as a result, it was basically the number of subscribers that increased the revenue, average annual revenue per subscriber. That is a negative, okay? So you declined. As a business, you wanna keep both positive. You want to have, you want to um, increase the number of new customers but you also want to increase the value per customer. Remember in the real world, it is cheaper to, um, to look after your, your current customers than is, to, um, than is to get new customers. And your current customers will most likely spend more because they know you, they'll be more loyal and so forth. So it's very important that although you want to in improve your number of customers or new customers. What's very important is to try to in, in, in increase the revenue per customer. So that is a negative over here, okay? So, so just keep that in mind. But you can look through that. That is, um, that is, value, that, that is financial statement analysis. We may need it for the valuation, but here is where we want to look into the proposal from Izinga LTD. When you see the word proposal, they're most likely um, talking about a, a potential acquisition or merger and you need to do a valuation. So Izinga manufactures and supplies various mechanical parts for motor vehicles to distributors across Southern Africa. Izinga have communicated to Coselo that they would like to initially acquire a 60% interest of the existing equity in Coselo. So it, it appears that Izinga is a much bigger entity relative to um, is a much bigger entity relative to Coselo. That is why Izinga can acquire Coselo. Okay. So obviously Izinga manufactures and supplies various mechanical parts for motor vehicles to distribute across South Africa. So I guess they want to they want to 
um, to expand their business, they want a new product line with tracking devices, as opposed to manufacture, manufacturing it themselves, they will, and that is expand organically, they will expand through an acquisition by acquiring a company that is already established in that business. Okay, so that is from a strategic point of view. Now we say Zynga have communicated to Cosello that they would like to initially acquire a 60% interest of the existing equity in Cosello. From a math point of view, from a Mac point of view, when you see that, when you see something more than 50%, what must go through your mind that you have a majority interest. So a, a, an appropriate valuation method would be PE multiple or free cash flow. Okay. What's important to also note, if you have a majority interest, you might just have a look whether they would want you to include a majority premium. So when you acquire a company for a majority stake, you may want to include a majority premium, but I'll show you afterwards. After a year, they would then like to acquire the remaining 40% interest, um, equity interest and merge Cosello and Izinga. Izinga plans on financing the acquisition of Cosello by means of a share exchange. Okay, so remember, from a merger and acquisition point of view, there are three aspects, the valuation, the, um, the financial analysis, whatever I called it last time, that is like earnings per share, PE multiple, dividend per share and so forth, and or financial effects. And then thirdly is the funding. So remember, how can you fund a, 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 an acquisition is either through cash and there's different ways you can fund the cash and then or through a share exchange. Here they want to do a, sh a share exchange. What they could typically ask you is um, for a, a, an exchange ratio. So what does that mean? How many shares must Izinga give um, or exchange with um, Cosello for Cosello shares? So that is a, a, an exchange ratio. So let's just take note of that. If I, if I just divert a bit over here, here they want to acquire um, a year later, they want to acquire another 40% interest. <clears throat> the same scenario can be taken and spun into, into when it comes to test three, they can spin it into, um, into fact two, fact four. So when we come to fact two, fact four, next semester, you want to deal with change in shareholding. And this is a, a, a typical example where you acquire a certain percentage of a company, and then later on, you acquire a further percentage. So this, something on this will take place um, in, in test three when we deal with change in shielding under fact two, fact four. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the equity valuation. So they say, Miss, um, Miss Sheshi, uh, she, she, uh, okay, Miss S, the management accountant of Koshelo took the initiative to prepare the following calculation of the equity value of Cosello based on the earnings multiple method of valuation. So here they're giving you a valuation, the earnings multiple, uh, the PE multiple. So, or an earnings multiple, we need to see what earnings multiple did they use. So it's value of equity equals profit off the tax multiplied by earnings ratio. So per price earnings ratio, price earnings ratio is the PE. So they say value of equity of Cusello is the 247 multiplied by 11, and that what gives you that amount. And they're telling you where the 2019 profit after tax, so they used the 2019 profit after tax. Okay, you can see, then they used, and then 2018 they're giving you, and they're giving you a price earnings ratio for 2019 price of a Zynga. So what they did was, they simply took um, 2019 multiplied by the PE multiple of of Izinga. So the first thing we need to ask ourselves, that profit after tax, is it a maintainable profit? So remember we want an earnings, profit after tax is the earnings figure, but we don't want any earnings figure. We want a maintainable or a sustainable earnings. So we need to find out whether that 2019 figure is a sustainable earnings figure. Secondly, the price earnings of 11 is the price earnings of Izinga. 
That's a problem. We will start off with, firstly, we need to ask ourselves, is Izinga truly comparable to, um, to Cusello? Izinga is in, in manufacturing motor spares, motor parts. Um, Cusello is not in motor parts. Cusello is in tracking devices. So firstly, Izinga may not be an appropriate comparable company. Izinga or the, or the management accountant should look to um, a, another listed company that is in tracking devices and use that as a starting point. And then they must still make the necessary adjustments. So here's two problems with that PE multiple. Number one, they're using Izinga, which may not be comparable. And then number two, they didn't make any adjustments between Izinga and, and um, Cosello. So that's the two problems with the 11. The problem with the, um, the profit after tax is not clear whether that is actually a maintainable earnings figure. So here you can see they're giving you the valuation. They'll probably ask you um, to, to critically evaluate that valuation. So we already picked up two things. You must remember there's two aspects to it. The maintainable earnings aspect and then the PE multiple. So in a question like this, you'll have a heading PE multiple and you'll give the, the you'll critically evaluate the PE multiple and give and make some comments. Then on the second heading, you'll have maintainable earnings and you will provide, you will critically evaluate and comment based on the maintainable earnings. Obviously, you'll have a will judge based on the um, on the on the number of marks. There's not enough information to, to see whether this is correct. So you'll just ask the question whether this is a maintainable earnings. But I can already see a problem with 11. Two things, Izinga is not comparable. And then secondly, they did not make any adjustments between the comparable PE multiple and that of Cosello itself. But that's not the discussion for today. The discussion for today is the forecast of financial um, information. Okay, so they say, forecast financial information of Cusello. The CFO of Cusello compiled the following projected financial information to prepare for the possible negotiations with Izinga. They have 2021, remember we are in 2019. So 2019 is your current year. So we will use forecast figures 2020, 2021, 2022. So they're using a three-year forecast. So remember, technically speaking, three years is too little. You want to get 10 to 15, but we're not arguing with this now. We're going to use that as is. So we have capital expenditure. We have depreciation and amortization. We have interest expense. We have investment income. We have tax expense and we have profit after tax. Okay, we will see how all of that fit in now. Notes. Capital expenditure represents the planned capital spend on additions to property, plant, and equipment. Interest expense relates to a long-term loan, which has a market value of 500 million rand. Cusello invests, um, note, um, note three, Cusello invests excess cash after considering operational requirements and capital investments in the short-term deposits this cash is expected to earn a pre-tax rate of 11% per annum. Okay. Um, the tax expense is based on projected taxable income. Then they have working capital. Okay, we will deal with that just now. Um, then we have additional information. The current inflation rate is 6% and is expected to remain the same for the foreseeable future. Cusello's Target debt equity ratio is 25%. Cusello's pre-tax cost of debt is 12.5. The beta coefficient of Cusello is currently estimated at 1.15. The current annual yield of long-term government bonds is 6.25, while the basket of listed companies in the same sector is 16.25. Assume a corporate tax rate of 28%. Cusello expect cash flows to grow at a stable rate of 6% per annum from 2023 onwards. Before we get into this, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you for, um, to give me some, what, what do you pick up from the, the additional information? I'm going to give you two minutes to tell me any, anything you pick up. 
um, from the additional information. I'll give you two minutes and you'll give me feedback. Faid, anything you pick up? Faid? Uh, is that the WAC, the cost of debt, 12.50? Okay, what else? Anything else? Fakir, anything else? Helen, Lerato, Rebecca, Ryan, anything you pick up? And is it uh, the that listed? It was a not a listed company. Mm -hmm. So the. Okay. Like the average of listed companies we use with that fee. Okay, we'll see now. I'm not going to give comments on this, what you're saying. Helen? Ryan? Akiri, quiet. Why is everybody so quiet? Ryan? From my side, I'm checking on the inflation rate, so it will not be increasing for some time in the future, foreseeable future. Okay. So I, that may help. Um, okay, I'm not going to comment. We will come when we when we work through it. Rato, Fakir, if you have nothing to say, at least just say you don't have anything to say. So at least know you're there. Oh, yeah, I am, yeah. I don't have anything to say. <laughs> okay. Um, Ryan? Um, Faid, uh, I don't know. I'm just seeing the beta coefficient. Um, what does that tell more, you? That looks more like the, when we do the WAC calculation or the, um, yeah, the cost of capital. What? Like I said, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, okay. but that's where I can pick it up. It was also part of with the long-term government bonds at 6.25%. So, so, so when we use that, we in the WAC do we use that? Do you, do you remember? I know we use it in the calculation. I just can't remember, remember where. Okay. Um, Lerato, Rebecca, any ideas? If you don't, you can just say, no, you don't. Just um, just do your participate. You don't have to say, so remember, I don't I don't mind if we get something wrong if we don't know. I just want just to, to keep the class participating. Um, so that, that is the only thing, okay? Um, Fakir, I see you, do you want to say something? Um, I just, I remember the beta coefficient when we use when evaluating um, equity for one of the uh, methods of the Okay, go on. You're on the right track. Go on. Um, oh. So we use cap. We use cap M and we use either cap M or um, yeah. I think okay, so. We, so, we use, so you're right. Where do we use cap M? When we're valuing the equity, the cost of equity. Okay, so that, that's how I wanted to get to that. So not value when we calculate because the word value refers to valuation, um, a rand amount. The cost of A, you were right, we use CAPIM, and CAPIM is used for cost of equity. Cost of equity is a percentage, okay? So just take note of that, okay? So why is this important? Because remember, for free cash flow, we need to get to a present value, 
Okay, so for free cash flow, we need to get to a present value. We are forecasting, uh, we are forecasting numbers into the future, but we need to discount those future cash flows to today, to a present value. In order to discount, we will need an appropriate discount rate. The appropriate discount rate for the free cash flow evaluation is the weighted average cost of capital. So they're going to test WAC over here without the necessary details of WAC. Like we're not, not going to be a 20 mark of WAC question like you would get in, in test one, but it'll be like it is over here. Okay. So <clears throat> one of the questions I'm going to share with you over the weekend is where uh, I just need to find, I can't remember where it is, but I know it. I, I've, I've used it almost every year. Um, where they're going to give you the free cash flow. So we're going to do the free cash flow. In that question, they give you the free cash flow. And I think for about the same 18 to 20 marks, they ask you to critically evaluate the valuation. So you must be able to know how, like, when a valuation is given to you, can you spot the errors? Okay. So I'm going to take us through this now. We're going to run till about half past nine. So just uh, put on your seat belts. Um, and where you're thinking cap now, okay? So um, try to put you in the zone, make as if that you that that um, you as if you are, you know that 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 um, with, not being derogatory now, but you know that monkey of um, of Elon Musk where he put in the, the the brain chip. So assume this session now you can we can install the brain chip so that when you get a free cash flow question you're going to be able to automatically answer the question based on the scenario. It's a very, very good scenario. It's going to cover basically every aspect of free cash flow. So put on your seatbelts and install your chip now so that that chip is going to re record and capture everything that we are learning over here. This is an extremely and extremely important um, section of the work and it's a very nice question 18 marks for covering basically every aspect it may not require all the calculations but it's covering all the aspects you need to cover in a free cash flow question so that when I give you for homework that that free cash flow question that you have to evaluate you should be able to critically evaluate it when you see it okay so just looking at it you might be able to spot the errors. Okay, so let's, let's jump straight into it. I just want to read the required with you quickly, because there's some important information in the required. So we're going to deal with this 18 marker, B1, okay? We're not going to deal with the rest. Um, so with B1, it says, calculate the fair market value of a 60% interest. So take note, we, we want 60% interest. In every valuation, we're going to calculate 100%. From the, once we get to 100%, we then convert it to 60%. So every valuation, you are calculating 100%. So they don't want a 100%, they want a 60%. So make sure once you're done with the valuation, come back to the required to make sure you answered the question. So the, the final answer of the valuation is going to be 100%. But then we need to convert it to what they want, 60%. Okay. In Cusello, as at 30 March 2019, remember I told you in, 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 in MAC, the date is always important. It's important for capital budgeting. It is important for WAC. It is important for valuations. You need a reference point. So 30th June 2019, that is um, the reference point that is year zero. And then here they're telling you using a free cash flow valuation and the provided information. Now remember, there's no need to argue now whether the, the cash flow valuation is appropriate or not. They're telling you use it. It is when you evaluate a, 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 a valuation method that, um, that you need to ask is this valuation method appropriate. Then they have here note, provide detailed calculations for all inputs and round to the nearest grand thousand 
the, spot, the starting point of your valuation should be profit after tax. They will always tell you what the starting point should be, especially for free cash flow. So for free cash flow, they will tell you what your starting point should be. If they don't tell you from a you NISA point of view, start here, because you, there's, a, there's a reason why your NISA want you to start here, because they're gonna test some concepts. In the, in, in the real world, we start with earnings before interest and tax. So in the real world, they start with earnings before interest and tax. In other words, they start with operating profit. You need to don't start with operating profit. You need to start with profit after tax. The reason being, they want to see whether you're making the correct adjustment. They're testing some principle. So by starting with operating profit, we eliminate, we basically skip the spot that we skip the step of starting with profit after tax and then getting to um, operating profit. So they want you to start with profit after tax and then get to operating profit. And the reason why they're doing this is to test some critical principles. So just take note, um, if you must pick up a UCT question paper and solution, they're not going to start with profit after tax. So remember, the starting point is irrelevant. You're still going to get to the same answer. Uh, um, just a starting point that differs. But for all the years I've tutored UNISA, they always asked to start with profit after tax. And the reason is there's some critical um, principles that they are testing. Okay, so just be aware of that. So now I'm going to switch over to Excel. And then we're going to work through. All we're going to work through is from this point on. Okay, so everything from this point on. So let's understand. Remember, there's two types of free cash flow um, free cash flow methods. You get the free cash flow to the firm, and then you get free cash flow to equity. We only use the free cash flow to equity when you value banks and and. Um, insurance companies. Okay, so when you value insurance companies, then you use the free cash flow to equity. Um, it's not in the scope of um, of cycle. Okay, what is in the scope is the free cash flow from operations. Okay, free cash flow to the firm. Same thing. Okay, so your starting point will be a profit an, um, a profit figure. So, like I said, if you pick up perhaps a, a UCT question. The starting point would be operating profit, earnings before interest and tax. But for UNISA, the starting point is going to be profit after tax. So the setup is similar to a capital budgeting setup. Okay, so the setup is similar to a capital budgeting setup. So here we have details. You have year zero. There was three years given, year one, year two, year three. What you want to do is put in the years, okay? So you want to put in the years, which was 31 March 2019. Then it was 31 March, what was it? 2020. Okay, then we just drag it across. Um, I use you're not showing the Excel. I'm not showing the Excel, sorry. Okay, you should see Excel now. Yeah, we can see. Okay, so <clears throat> you set it up in the same manner how you would set it up in, um, how you'd set up a cash, this is like a cash flow format, okay? So this is a cash flow format. So here we go. Here we have the cash flow format. You have year year naught, which is your reference point, and then you have year one, year two, year three. We're just using the explicit period. So this period that they gave us, that is known as the explicit period. So the specific years, the the, the, the specific forecast years, that is known as the explicit period. At the end of the explicit period, we will add the terminal value or the continuing value. The terminal or continuing value that captures the value for the remainder of the lifetime. So basically from 2023 onwards, okay? So our starting point 
can be basically any profit number prof of operating profit earnings before interest and tax. But like I said, the question specifically asked us to start with profit after tax. Okay, the question specifically asked us to start with profit after tax. And what's important to take note is they want to make certain adjustments. What you are trying to get to, what you are trying to get to is a cash flow from operations. What we are aiming to get is to start with a profit number, which includes non cash flow items and move to a cash flow from operations. Now, this is important. This is extremely important to understand. So we are starting with a profit number and we want to get to a cash flow number. We're starting with a profit number and we're trying to get to a cash flow number. That's number one. Remember, profit number includes non cash flow amounts. The second thing is we're moving from a profit after tax number and moving to a cash flow from operations. This numbers over here must represent cash. But further than that, it can't be any cash. It is only cash from operations. Included in our profit number would be amounts relating to investing, would be amounts relating to financing, and would be amounts relating to operating or operations. We only want numbers relating to operations. Okay, someone is up, says a message. That's fine. You, that's fine. I understand. You can join. You can leave. You will get the recording. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we will have cash flow from operations. Okay. So just take note of that. You're starting off with a profit number, and you want to get to a cash flow number. Over and above that, you're starting with a profit number, which include operating numbers which include investing numbers, which include financing numbers, but you want to get to an operating number. <laughs> so that's very important. So the adjustments you're going to make is two types of adjustments. Number one, non cash flow items. And then number two, anything that is not representing operating numbers. So any financing related number, any, any investing related number, those will be removed. Okay, so just take note of that. Are we happy with that? Are we okay with that? Anyone? Yes. Okay. So now we will deal with some further items. Okay. So typical things will be if we have a look at um, our income statement, if we go back to the scenario. So we are starting with profit after tax. Okay. Included in profit after tax. So I just want to show you something quickly. So how to think through it. Typically, you will start with operating profit. So typically, it will look like this. Operating profit, then um, operating profit, another term for operating profit is earnings before interest and tax. And then you will add back depreciation. And that will give you cash flows, OK? Cash flow. Um, operating cash flows. Okay, so this will give you operating cash flows. That will give you operating cash flows. So that is what will happen. Then we will adjust for two more things. Ch 
changes in working capital and we will adjust for capital expenditure then we will have um, then we will have then you will have cash flow from operations because remember if you think about this you starting with earnings before interest interest is a financing related item you don't want it in then you take out depreciation because depreciation is a non cash flow and we get to our operating cash flow then we must take into a, into account working capital because to run your business you require working capital and then we have capital expenditure because ppe is your long term assets required to operate the business so therefore we take um, um, P capital expenditure in, into account and we get our cash flow from operations then we get a terminal value okay and this will give you cash flow um, this will give you free cash flows to the firm okay so that is basically what we will get over there so just take note of that this is ultimately where we want to get to that's ultimately where we want to get to so you're going to add your terminal value and we'll deal with this now with unisa we don't start with operating profit what does unisa start with unisa starts with um profit after tax so included in profit after tax there may be income relating to investments that is not part of your core business so it's non operating so included in a profit after tax is non operating income typical example of non operating income is investments okay which is your non core business you don't want it in in the number so you remove it out similarly we starting with profit after tax which may include interest interest is a financing component and therefore we need to remove interest so just take note we trying to move from a profit number that includes operating financing and investing num um, amounts we only want operating amounts so therefore we remove all financing related amounts all um investment related amounts something is investment related if it does, does not form part of your core operations so just take a note that is why what we can adjust for over here if you have a look at the scenario again here we have interest expense if you read note number 2 it says interest expense relates to a long term loan which have a market value of 500 million rand long term loans forms part of your capital structure your capital structure is your sources of long term finance we don't want any financing so therefore we need to remove interest expense now included in profit after tax is interest expense interest expense reduced profit after tax so what are we going to do to to remove it we must add it back so we will say add interest expense so once again included in profit after tax is interest expense which is a financing amount we don't want it over there this financing amount this interest expense reduced profit after tax we don't want it in there so to remove it we add it back so if we have a look we must add back 56 56 56 okay so we're going to add back 56 56 56 um 56000 rand now free cash flow we, we want it from an operation amount but remember we want it an after tax operation amount so therefore we take tax into account so 
um, tax on interest by increasing profit of the tax by increasing profit of the tax we will um, be reducing um, our profit so this is going to equal I think the tax rate was 28 percent so so it's going to be minus that times 28 percent so what we're taking out we're taking out the net interest amount of the tax okay so remember we're working out the valuation we wanted and after tax amount so we dealt with interest expense okay we know we're going to deal with capital expenditure just now we're going to deal with depreciation just now then we have investment income let's go hear what they say about investment income Cusello invest excess cash excess cash remains me excess the word excess cash refers to the fact that it's not part of operations, okay? After considering operational requirements and capital investments, um, so they invest excess cash in short-term deposits. So what is excess cash? Anything that is not used for operations. So once it's not used for operations, it cannot be an operating income. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to remove the investment income. Okay, so what is it? 23307. Now the investment income is included in profit after tax. It's not an operating income, it's an investment income. How do we know it is invest? So it doesn't mean that the word investment income means it's a, an investment amount. You must have a look what does income relate to. As we can see, it relates to um, income earned on excess cash. Excess cash is, is non-operating. So just take note of that. Excess cash is non-operating. So therefore we need to remove it. So including operating in, included in profit of the tax is investment income, which is a non-operating amount. So therefore we need to remove it. The investment income increased um, profit of the tax. So to remove it, we must subtract. So less investment income. Okay, so less investment income. That was 23,307. So we're gonna say minus 23,307. Once again, tax on investment income. We want the after tax amount. So it's going to equal, it's going to be the opposite direction, that times 28%. Oh, we obviously need to start with profit after tax. Let me just see what was profit after tax. Can someone just help me read out the numbers? 256452. Two five six four five two. What's the other one? Two eight nine. Two eight nine. Six five zero. Six five zero. Mm -hmm. And then three three two. Three three two. Six five zero. Six five zero. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. Okay. So we start off with those numbers. So, so basically this is gonna give you operating cash flow. Okay, operating cash flow, operating profit, sorry. Operating profit. In other words, earnings before interest and tax. Okay, you don't have to name it this. We will just put it there. So now we get to the starting point that every other a normal valuation would have. So why Eunice is doing this? It's just to test some principle, okay? In the real world, you don't have to do this. You start with operating profit. Just an important aspect, in some examples, this interest expense may include interest expense on bank overdraft. And sometimes the bank overdraft relates to operations. So then you will leave the interest expense on bank overdraft that relates to operations. Because remember, you want all expenditure 
about all cash flows relating to operations. So just be cognizant of that. Now we have operating profit. So now we can go to the, the standard format. We have operating profit. Now we're gonna do depreciation. So I think, what did they call it? Depreciation and amortization. So depreciation and amortization. So um, depreciation is a non-cash flow amount. We want a cash flow amount. So include it in here. Included in here is depreciation, which is non-cash flow. We want to get to cash flow. So we need to remove depreciation. Depreciation decreased operating profit. So what we're gonna have to do to remove it, we're going to have to add it back. Okay, so we're happy with that. So the way you're gonna add it back you will just add it back. Um, what's depreciation? 35. Can someone just read out 35? I think I saw 42 and then 57. Can you just confirm that for me? 35, 45, and 57. So the last one is right. This must be 45. Yeah. Like that. Okay. So there we have that. Um, now we will, we go, to, we're going to need to get um, change in working capital and then capital expenditure. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this over. So capital expenditure was given, take it as is 10, 25, 36. So capital expenditure, you're spending money, so it's an outflow, 10,000. <laughs> 10,000, what did I see now? 10, 25, 36, 25, negative 36. Okay, so what you should know, capital expenditure is an outflow. So therefore it is going to be um, negative. I'm gonna give you a working for capital expenditure just in case you don't, it's not given. Okay, I'll show you how to work it out. Then we're going to have um, changes in working capital. So you need to generally include the working over here. I don't do the working over here. I do a separate working. Okay, so I'm going to have my workings. So let's just do this quickly. So working. So workings, here we have working one, okay? So working one, we're gonna have the changes in working capital. I'm going to do this. Okay, so you, you will list all your working capital. So your working capital is debtors, inventory, and it depends on, not all the time, but it, but it can also be non-excess cash, okay? So debtors, inventory, non-excess cash or operating cash, and then trade payables. In this scenario, they never broke it up like that. They simply said current assets, they said our working capital is current assets and then current liabilities. Okay, so what you'll have to do in a scenario, if they break it up for you, you will have to ask yourself, which of these current assets are working capital? Inventory, debt is definitely, okay? But it may also be non-operating cash, cash or, or um, I mean, non-excess cash or operating cash. Then for current liabilities, it will typically be trade payables. But you want to be careful if they give you a list of current liabilities, a list of current assets, you need to ask yourself, which of these are working capital? 
which of these are operating assets and liabilities. Okay, so just take note of that. So then we will get um, total and then we will get what we're looking for, the change, okay? Change in working capital. So this is what we are looking for. So I'm going to need someone's help again. Fakir, can you just help me out again? Um, so current assets. So we take this list over here. So I'll take current assets, 232015. Fakir, can you just help me again? 232015. Okay. Yeah. And then 256. Oh, there's current liabilities now. Oh, you're doing liabilities. Okay, yeah. So liabilities is 220125. 220125. Okay. Okay, okay. Give me all the current assets. It's fine. Give me go for 2020. What is it? Uh, 256. 256. Yeah. 1000. Like 256. Mm. Okay. And then next current asset? 352. 352. 620. 620. Okay. Then last one? 421. 421. 560. 560. Okay. Yeah. Um, then um, current liabilities? 218. 219. 360. 360. The last one? 369. 369. 665. 665. Okay. Um, now we will now remember we want the working capital. So it is current assets minus current liabilities. You add up all the current assets and you subtract it from the sum of all the current liabilities. So it is that. But we don't want this is a balance. These are balances. You want a movement. So the movement is this year minus last year. Well, actually, to get the, to get it better, just say last year minus current year. So you already know that is an outflow. So when it is negative, it is an outflow. When it's positive, it is an inflow, okay? What's important, you want the change in working capital. When they give you a valuation and they ask you to critically evaluate the valuation, one of the common mistakes that's gonna happen in the valuation is that the current, is, is the, the, the change in working capital, they're gonna use the total balance. You don't want the total balance. You don't want a balance. You want the movement. Because remember, at the end of 2019, that was the balance. At the end of 2020, that was the balance. So the way it went from that balance to that, there must have been a cash flow movement of 25,620. So just take note of that. A common error is that they're going to use the balance, but you don't want a balance. You want the movement in the year, the change in working capital. So just take note of that. So you say um, prior year minus current year. Why? That is going to help you to, to see whether there's an inflow and outflow. So negative implies it's an outflow. So I'm just going to say equal to that. And it's coming from working one. Okay, so it's coming from working one. Okay, so that is basically all the stuff. Now we have free crash flow of the firm. Okay, um, I'm just gonna call this here free cash flow from operations.
free cash flow from operations. Then you will have terminal value. And this will be, this will be free cash flow of the firm. What did I just do? Oh, don't need that. So we add up. So there we have all the numbers. Now we're gonna work out the continuing value or the terminal value. So we're gonna work out the continuing value or the terminal value. So the way you work out is as follows. This is also gonna be a, a typical area in a valuation that they're gonna give you and you must evaluate that will be wrong, okay? So you must pay careful attention. As I quickly go to the bathroom, um, as I get a tissue, um, while I go, while I get a tissue, can you just have a look at this in the meantime and make sense of it? And if you have any questions, you can ask me at the end of the lesson, as coming now. Okay. Okay. So now we're going. Okay. So now we're going to do the terminal value once again. For the terminal value, for the terminal value, is going to be a typical area in where it will um, we they will do the calculation incorrectly. So once again, pay careful attention as to how I do the calculation. And when they give you a evaluation and you have to critically evaluate by just looking over, you must already be able to spot the errors without necessarily the, the, knowing the exact detail, okay? So for the terminal value, the format is similar to a dividend growth model, okay? So it's free cash flow. Um, free cash flow for the latest explicit period. So speak, the latest explicit period is year three multiplied by, multiplied by one plus G. So if you have a look at this, if you remember that the dividend growth model, the dividend growth model is D1, dividend of the next period. Okay, so actually let's do it this way. It is free cash flow year four. You look at the dividend growth model, 
It says value equals D1. How do you get D1? It is D naught multiplied by one plus G. So similarly over here, we want the free cash flow. <coughs> Sorry. We want the... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. We want the free cash flow of year three. We want the free cash flow of year four. In order to get the free cash flow of year four, we simply say D one um, um, free cash flow year three multiplied by one plus G. So just take note, free cash flow year four equals free cash flow year three multiplied by one plus G. It's the same, similar to dividend growth model where D one equals D naught one times G, okay? One plus G. So just be aware of that, okay? So free cash flow divided by WAC minus G. Now remember, the dividend growth model says D1 divided by KE minus G, cost of equity minus G. So some over here, we're not using cost of equity, we're using WAC. Now this is important because they may mix it up in the in the um, in, a, in, a, in a question where they give you the free cash flow. You want free cash flow of the next period, so you use the latest free cash flow or the period before and grow it by the growth rate. The dis the, the appropriate discount rate for the free cash flow is whack. Why? Free cash flow represents a, a, a complete investment, a business. So when we use capital budgeting, when you look into investing into a project, we use the WAC rate. So same thing over here, we're looking to invest, we're looking at the business and operation. So we use the WAC rate. In the dividend growth model, we use cost of equity. Why? Because we're valuing dividends specifically and dividends specifically relates to equity. So see that difference. And then over here, we use the growth rate. So they may get this right. They may get free cash flow right, but in instead of using WAC rate, they use the dividend growth model. So, I mean, they use the cost of equity. So please just be aware of that. So now, in order to get, um, in order to get the terminal value, In order to get the terminal value, we need free cash flow, we need WAC, and we need G. We need the growth rate. The growth rate is the rate that will, that will, that will continue forever and ever. If I remember correctly, in the scenario, the growth rate given was 6%, right? Was it six percent? Yes, six percent growth. Okay, so the growth rate was six percent. Okay, the WAC rate we have to work out WAC. Okay, so we're gonna have to work out WAC, and then the free cash flow is simply going to be free cash flow of year one, of year three, sorry, which is the three fifty five 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 four. So this is going to be. Um, 355, I mean, not 355, 351, 554, multiplied by one plus G, okay, which is 6%. Okay, so it is equal to that amount, the latest amount before the terminal value, multiplied by one plus the growth rate of 6%. So that is that over there. Then we're going to get 
then we're going to get our whack rate. So whack, we set up the table. So for whack, we're going to set up the table. Um, we're going to have data source of finance. We're going to have market rate after tax. We're going to have, remember, we usually have market value. There's no need for market value because they gave us a weighting. So we're just going to have weighting. There's no need for the market value. And then we're going to have whack. So we have equity and we have debt. Equity, debt was given to us as 12.5%, but it was before tax. We needed after tax, so times 0 0.72. Okay. Um, equity, we have to work it out. So if I go working for, we're going to say cost of equity equals risk free rate um, plus beta multiplied by market rate minus risk free rate. So, cost of equity, we have the risk free rate, we have beta, we have RM. So, the risk free rate was given to us as government bonds is considered the risk free rate. So government bonds is, where did I see that? Government bonds, 6.25. So government bonds is 6.25 and RM, a basket of listed companies is 16.25. So the risk-free rate, which is government bonds, 6.25. RM, the market rate, 16.25, beta 1.15. So cost of equity is equal to the risk-free rate plus beta multiplied by, multiplied by the market rate minus the risk-free rate. So therefore, cost of equity is Okay, so th there we got that. Now we must get the weighting. Now this is something very important to take note on the weighting. They gave us the debt equity ratio. The debt equity ratio is, what did they say? 25%, I think. Okay, so they said the debt equity ratio is 25%. So what you must understand, for the debt equity ratio to be 25%, we have to make up some numbers here, okay? So for it to be 25%, basically it is debt divided by equity. So debt divided by equity gave you 25%. So one way for that to be is that debt is 25 and equity is 100. 
So 25 divided by 100 will give you 25%. Now remember the weighting is, the weighting is debt as a percentage of debt plus equity. So that's very important, okay? The weighting in WAC is debt as a percentage of total finance, i.e. debt plus equity. Okay, the same goes for equity. The same goes for equity. The weighting is equity as a percentage of total finance, debt plus equity. So total finance, total finance has to be as follows. In order for the debt equity ratio to be 25%, debt had to be 25% and equity had to be 100. So that's how you will get to 25%. Any numbers that will give you 25%. But the easiest way is saying debt 25 over equity 100 will give you 25%. So therefore, debt is 25, equity is 100. So therefore, total finance, total long-term finance, is equal to the sum of the two. So now we can work out the debt percentage, the debt weighting, and the equity weighting. So remember the weighting is debt as a percentage of total finance, equity as a percentage of total finance. So therefore it's going to equal to debt as a percentage of total finance and equity as a percentage of total finance. Very, very important. Okay, so don't get fooled on this. Don't get fooled on this. You don't want the debt equity ratio. You want debt as a percentage of total finance, equity as a percentage of total finance. The way to get total finance is to make equity 100 and to make debt, the debt equity ratio, because that's how you'll get to the answers and then you work through it over here. Okay, so for working five, we have the weighting. It is 20% debt, 80% equity. So equity 0 0.8, debt 0 0.2. Where did I get that? Working five. Where did I get this? Working five. Okay. So now I can get WAC. WAC, market rate times waiting. Market rate times waiting. Okay. Just multiply this by 100, so it's in a percentage. Multiplied by 100. So now we can get the WAC rate. So it's sixteen percent. Okay. Okay, so now we can have a look. So we don't we don't to use that. So WAC working three, 16 percent. So now the terminal value is going to be free cash flow divided by WAC minus the growth rate. Take note, very similar to the dividend growth model. Just look at the different inputs. So as you can see, the terminal value 
is that 3.7 million Rand. I will go and I'll go plug it in. Equal 3.7 million. As you can see, if you have a look over there now, look at the terminal value versus the individual um, free cash flow numbers. Very different. The one is in, in, in hundreds of thousands, whereas the other one is in, in millions. So just take note. You can see the terminal value always makes up the significant number. So now we can add up. And then we will be able to get a, a present value. So now we will be able to get a present value of, um, we will be able to get a present value now of our, um, So here we're going to have discount rate and the discount rate is whack. Don't forget that. So the discount rate is whack, which is 16%. Value of business. So this is now the value of the business operating business. That's the value of the business. If I say NPV, if I open it up, it's going to be the rate, value one, value two, value three. So that's the value of the business 100%. Now we must make some, we need to do some other things. Remember that value of the business is value of the operations. Value of operations. We want the value of the entire business, not just of operations. So what do we do? We add, we add market value of non-core assets, so or non-operating assets. So we add the we add the market value of non-operating assets. Then we subtract market value of debt. Then we subtract market value of debt. And this will give you, this will give you value of equity. What we want to get to, we want to get to the value of equity. But then we must make some further adjustments. Because remember, we, we are valuing a, um, a private company. So then we will adjust, adjust for lack of marketability. A private company can't be traded easily because there's no market for it. There's no JSE for it. So therefore, we that is different to a, a company listed on the JSE where you can trade via the JSE. So there's some marketability over there. For a private company, there's lack of marketability, can't be easily traded. So somewhere they, they gave us a percentage in the scenario. Um, somewhere I saw it. Somewhere they gave you a percentage, if I read correctly. They don't give you a percentage, you make up a percentage. The percentage you give, the maximum percentage you give is 5%, okay? But otherwise, you'll, they will tell you what they want. And then this will give you adjusted market value of equity, okay? But now remember, that is 100%. So now we will say value of 60%. The value of the 60% will simply be 60% of the adjusted value. Okay, so this is gonna be our final answer. What I want you to do for me is to plug in all of these numbers. 
Okay, so the ones highlighted in yellow, I'm gonna stop here because we um, people's gonna lose concentration, is to just basically add the market value of non-operating assets, subtract the market value of debt, which will give you the value of equity, what we want. And then we say, hang on, um, we're valuing a private company. So we have to make an adjustment for lack of marketability. You could have also made an adjustment for a majority interest, but we will leave that for now. And then we will get the 100% of the value of equity for this particular business. But we don't want 100%, we want 60%. So that will be the answers. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there. Um, I want you guys to work out the market value of equity and find if there is any market value of non-operating assets. And then you, for, for the lack of marketability, you take 5% of the value of equity if they don't give you a number. If they do give you a percentage, you use that percentage, but if they don't give you a percentage, just use 5%. Um, then you will get, you will subtract, okay? So this is a minus. And then for 60%, you will just take 60% of the adjusted market value of equity, okay? Is that okay for you guys? If you can do that and send it to me by Friday, I'll have a look and, um, and then I'll, I'll upload on, um, I'll upload all this stuff by Friday as well. Do you guys have any questions? Faid, Fakir, Ryan, Tandi? No questions. Okay. Fakir? No questions. No questions. Okay, so next week we're gonna do another question on this, um, another valuation type question. I'm gonna ask you for input in terms of what are the theories and the implications when you do a valuation question. But other than that, I'll stop here because I mean, we ran quite a bit. You guys are probably tired. So I'll end the lesson here, okay. Okay, goodbye.